Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Cohen. I am the director of the Gene Beer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics, which is one of the co-sponsors for today's discussion. We also have funding that we're grateful for that is coming from the Center for Human Rights and Democracy, the Charles G. Koch Charitable Foundation, and the Department of Religious Studies, along with, as always, the taxpayers of the state of Georgia. <laughs> Members of the military service often put their lives on the line so that political authorities can project force for various ends. But as we know, the military asks a lot of its members. Besides the risk to their lives, they often are at risk of transforming their senses of self and their understandings of what is right or wrong. Their experiences produce lasting impacts on their lives. And as we know, not all of these experiences are things for them to celebrate. In fact, I've heard that many veterans and veterans activists have misgivings about the idea of simply throwing parades for people who have returned from military service for their country. They sometimes think that something more, if not something altogether different, is called for. Today's panel hopes to continue to an ongoing conversation about the place of veterans in a society that projects force, sometimes projects morally controversial force. We got plenty of spots right up front. <laughs> you get right there, front row seats for it. Yeah, yeah that's right. We got another seat up here, another one over there. All right, thanks for coming, guys. So as I was mentioning, sometimes people have misgivings about what the appropriate response is to, uh, to veterans in a free society, how it is that citizens and political authorities might integrate veterans as they return from projects and from, uh, from deployments that are sometimes morally controversial. So we're structuring today's event as a panel conversation. Of course, there is far too much to say in one 75-minute session, but we hope to continue the conversation by asking the panel to draw from their own research and from their own experience. So joining us today are five experts from different areas of research, clinical experience, or from on-the-ground experience. We have Professor Elizabeth Bounds, who is the Associate Professor of Christian Ethics with Emory's Candler School of Theology. <clears throat> we have William Joshua Brooks, who is a Lieutenant Colonel and Professor of Military Science with Georgia State University's ROTC program. We have Rich Lickstein, who is a Behavioral Health Counselor with the SHARE Military Initiative for Atlanta's Shepherd Center. We have Professor Steve Kirshnar, who teaches at SUNY Fredonia. And we also have Rich Williams, who was a consultant working for the U.S. Vietnam War Commemoration Office and who has other military experience. You can read much more about today's panelists in the brochure that we have distributed. So we're going to proceed with each panelist offering five to six minutes of remarks. And then, after that, they'll have a conversation among themselves for a couple of minutes about each other's remarks. And then we're going to open it up to general conversation. And we hope that the exchange will deepen our understanding of the issues, such as how might members of society, such as ours, best understand what, if anything, we owe to veterans who served in our armed forces. And as we look back at past military engagements and consider the likely prospect of future ones, how might we best understand the role and place of veterans now? Of course, we needn't stick rigidly with these questions since our conversation will spill over into other issues. So please let us begin with Professor Elizabeth Bounds, who joins us from Emory University. Professor Bounds. Uh, you could, yeah, <laughs> wherever you're comfortable. <laughs> of the 
woman who was about to be executed in death uh, from, uh, in Georgia that I've known for over 10 years, and that uh, her appeal was denied for a commutation to a little sentence. So it's kind of a big week. Uh, but let me get to the topic today. Now, there's an obvious connection between prisons, which I'm not going to talk about, and uh, veterans in that there are significant numbers of veterans who, due to their experiences in suffering and war, have ended up living in ways that lead to incarceration, generally via paths of drugs and alcohol addiction, homelessness, um, and uh, various forms of violence. But this most significant connection that I want to highlight today comes around two concept areas that I've been working with that cross over in my mind between more secular forms of discourse of various sorts and the religious perspective, in my case, Christian discourse. And that's restorative justice and moral injury. So I thought I'd talk just briefly about those in a way that highlighted one of the questions uh, raised just now, what does society owes to veterans? Moral injury is a, more, is a more recent category, and it came to my attention because of work of two colleagues in religious and theological studies, Peter Brock and Gabriella Latini, who wrote a book called Soul Repair, which explored the experiences of veterans returning from the Iraq War. And they organized, as that book came out, several truth and reconciliation commissions where, for veterans to speak about their experiences in, this, in the Iraq, primarily the Iraq War at that point. Um, they argue in their book that we, we need to understand the emotional suffering and the high rates of depression and suicide among vets as a wound of war, which they describe as moral injury or a violation of core beliefs. And to frame that, they drew on the work of clinical psychologist Brett Litz and his colleagues at the Veterans Administration, who were beginning to use this category because they had discovered that a PTSD framework was failing to pay sufficient attention to the moral and ethical implications of the experiences that veterans were having. Now, the work of Latini and Brock and, and mine too, pushes also in some different ways than even Lynch's clinical response. Because it is hard for clinical discourses to talk um, about morality, in my view, in ways that ordinary people kind of understand. Like it makes sense of the old, their way that they think about moral meaning and their moral experience. But when you keep pressing the question of what do you mean morally by moral agency, you start getting, po start poking at some difficult questions of agency and responsibility. These are ambiguities even in the folks who have been developing these kinds of definitions. Jonathan Shea, who worked a lot with uh, guys who have been in women who have been in Vietnam, the way he thinks about moral and, and injury says that it means that there's been a betrayal of what's right by someone in legitimate authority. So he focuses on the failures of those in command. Um, with, in, in, in contrast, as a definition that suggests a range of relevant agency in the experience of moral in injury, because he says he defines it as involving an act of transgression that creates dissonance and conflict because it violates assumptions and beliefs about right and wrong and personal goodness. The same idea that, there, that there's a violation of assumptions and beliefs about right and one's moral beliefs but it, the, an act of transgression is not clear, and, and he says that that could not necessarily be one you want perpetrated, but it could be one that one witnessed. Um, so there's a lot of different dimensions of what is the agency involved in the action around moral in injury. Um, it's an individual with moral injury may begin to view himself as immoral, irredeemable, and unrepairable, or believe that he or she lives in an immoral world. There's a loss of moral expectation and moral trust. And I'd say it's a combination of a loss of faith in one's own moral goodness and in the goodness of the surrounding society. Um, so what, I want, what I'm emphasizing here is that by starting to think about the experience of veterans within that they might have suffered something we could call moral agent, moral injury, we're opening up some very complex questions about who's responsible, who's, who did what, who are, who's the perpetrator, who's the recipient of the violence. And, and much of it is 
discussion of moral injury, the kinds of things that vets are experienced, that they have not been the objects of the violence. They have either been the perpetrators of violence or they have witnessed violence being perpetrated. So that starts getting very complicated for how, do you, how, does, how does the person who's experienced this understand themselves? I mean, they're not a perpetrator. They're not a victim. So what are they? Or they're not a perpetrator in the simple sense of that. I mean, there's the issues of acting under command. But again, it could be that you witnessed a series of horrific events, the killing particularly of uh, civilians, innocent, uh, people that we categorize as innocent women and children. Um, so that the, uh, we, and what, and this is where my criminal justice interests come in, because it began, it's become more and more interesting to me that even though, from what I understand from listening to folks who are veterans, that they may understand themselves in ways comparable to the way we think about criminal justice, in that they are at fault for something, they are stigmatized for something. Normally, our society has rigorously <laughs> excluded veterans from any dimension of a criminal justice paradigm. If you're if you are labeled as a criminal, you are you are an unworthy person. Uh, you have done very bad things. You have done you know all these things. The difficulty that I think a lot of veterans face is that they feel like that kind of person. But the but our society, and I'm not saying we should, but some of the gap is that our society you know, vigorously refuses to even imagine that such a thing is possible. And I think that's part of the gap or the um, void, in a sense, that, uh, I, that many veterans feel. Um, I think then, so along with this complex sense of agency is necessarily a complex sense of responsibility. Um, res that we, in this society, we like to think of responsibility in a fairly individualized way. We've moved away. We don't want to consider what veterans have done in a sort of individual, um, somebody did this to that, and therefore they're responsible to that person. On the other hand, we're, we're reluctant also to look, though, at the responsibility that, led, that leads folks into these situations, the responsibility of command. And we're even more reluctant to ask questions about broader social responsibility. What is our collective responsibility for what folks have gone through? And this is where I think I, I understand what you're saying. I completely agree that nothing, therefore, is more annoying than thanking people for gratitude for service. Um, because in my view, morally, that's an excuse of responsibility. I mean, that we are just basically helping ourselves feel good when we thank people for their service. Um, because we actually are stepping away by saying, you've, we say you've protected us, but what we refuse to, what we're not saying is that we as a society have any responsibility for the war that we've perpetrated and the things that happened in that war. And that is so much of what veterans struggle with, is they know what, what was done, and they're struggling with their own agency and responsibility in relationship to that. Um, so that, I think, is an area for broader discussion, which I've talked in you know, more moral terms and not so much in religious terms. But uh, the other uh, term I wanted to highlight, restorative justice, is much more embedded in um, questions of religion. Now, restorative, all these common, these terms can always be used in a million ways. Restorative justice is currently used in certain circles of, of, the criminal, of our criminal justice system to signal alternative forms of, um, uh, process, I mean, the, the, the alternative forms, uh, instead of imprisonment, that there's alternative forms like community service, victim offender dialogues, that kind of thing. It's part of a push in our society a little push, not very big push, um, to find some other roads for dealing with crime than straight up incarceration. However, the term itself, its roots are in much older traditions where religion, religion was woven into the social framework. You can find forms of restorative justice in Christian, Jewish, Islamic, and indigenous traditions. I'm sure in others too, but I'll just tell you the ones that I, I, I've seen. Um, in its simplest form, it is common obligation for moral repair for harms that rests in the whole community. Justice is, in, is enacted within the community, fulfilling
fulfilling its obligation to heal and put right harm. It necessarily widens the scope of moral consideration because it, and, and with the scope of responsibility because it says that the, the injury that has occurred is the business of all involved, including the broader community. Um, in early, in some earlier forms, this obligation took the form of, I mean, I think this is the one, another piece besides that broader communal responsibility, which is very attenuated in our society and very hard to talk about. It's not surprising that some of these restorations have happened through indigenous tradition. It's been used in Canada and New Zealand in criminal justice because there are still some fragments of this notion of a communal responsibility for uh, uh, offense, harm, and hurt. But, in early, but I, I just want to close with the, the way that talk about the moment, the way restorative justice allows us to also think of the role of ritual. And of which there is precious little, certainly, I mean, I, mean, I mean, there are rituals in the military, but what does it mean to leave the military or enter into society? We don't have any really rituals for that transformation, which is a major transformation. Now, early Christian penitential manuals, for example, prescribed fasting and other practices on return for war. For war. The, uh, this is a penitential, uh, you know, describing what the you know, practices of penance you're supposed to do, um, ascribed to Theodore of Tarsus, who was the 7th century Archbishop of Canterbury, he's not the one ago. Um, he it says that those who have conducted war cannot enter the church or take communion for 40 days. 40 days in Christian tradition is a symbolic number. Uh, Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. I mean that it is a it is a number that signals a liminal and transformative period. And it's interesting that warriors were supposed to stay out of sacred spaces for that 40 day period. And, but a more recent example that I'm going to close with that I've experienced of, I think, a form of ritualized restorative justice, just a tiny fragment, is in the, believe it or not, the dance and drum competition at the annual Stone Mountain Indian Festival in Powa. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's there every year. Just before the competition, after they've had the formal parade in, they always do a warrior dance. The leader frames the dance as a way of honoring warrior service and invites all veterans, whether native or not, to join the circle and asks all the people there to stand in response to the sacredness of the event. Then he starts to lead a slow procession of, of sort of dance, but movement. And then behind him, as I've seen this, that at first there are a whole group of people who are participating in the um, Native festival who are dressed as Native, you know, different different tribal uh, wares, what they're what they uh, they're uh, clothed in. But behind them come a line. This is the thing I find the most interesting: a line of people who simply emerge from the crowd, men and women. Some move is very slowly, limping. Some many in blue jeans, trucker hats, lots of trucker. The line winds around the performance area, graceful in some places, halting in others. What I love about this, which is just the tiniest little fragment, is that I feel that at that moment we are saying something more than thank you for your service. We are, we are just trying to perform something of honor and transition from this tiny little leftover fragment of, of of a broader, I would say, restorative justice tradition, um, as we, the uh, our, uh, audience, in a sense, are silent and, then, and wrapped in the more and mournful sounds and the rhythmic movement of the action. And I consider that a very small embodiment of how one might restoratively heal the forms of moral injury. I think. We'll next be hearing from Josh Brooks. Thanks for having me. Hey, uh, good afternoon. How are we doing? Good afternoon. Good. Any veterans in the room? Okay, so keep me honest. Um, really, uh, really an opportunity and a privilege to be here in front of the group. Um, I reviewed the, the um, 
description of the event that was provided to me, and I'm going to try <clears throat> to answer uh, based on my experiential opinion um, how, how maybe veterans think about the answers to those questions, and then I wanted to offer a couple additional thoughts for your consideration. So the, the first question that I got out of the, uh, the email inviting me here was, what do we owe our veterans? What do we owe our veterans that finish um, participation in military service or in combat operations as they return to society and try and reintegrate? Um, first and foremost that stands out in my mind brightly is we need an informed, engaged society. One of the problems that we have today is that everybody wants to watch Honey Boo Boo and they don't want to inform themselves about matters of great importance, so they think that Saddam is one of the Al-Qaeda's and that justifies our invasion of Iraq. When in actuality, ba the Ba'ath Party would have tortured and killed anybody affiliated with Al-Qaeda in Iraq, for, for example. We need people who are going to hold our government accountable because politicians are busy with com competing priorities and soldiers become numb to danger, to conflict, to cold, to heat. Additionally, they're obligated to do what they are told to do. We signed up. I get the benefits, I get the pay, I get the retirement. But when, when you ask me, I'm going to go engage with the enemy and destroy them in close combat. That's the deal. They call, you go. There it is. So we are not able to stand up and go, hey, wait a minute, let's talk about this. And the politicians are likely to not stand up and go, hey, wait a minute, what's right? They're more likely going to say, what's going to get me reelected? And I, I am a, a, a loyal, faithful member of the military, and if they call today, I will go, regardless of where it is. But to a hammer, everything is a nail. So when the president asks the generals if we need more troops for the war, 99 times out of 100, what's the answer going to be, y'all? Yes. Yes. So that's why we need a participative society to stand up and say, hey, hold on a second. Let's think through these ideas. Let's talk about this stuff. I think we need the support and services that are being offered to our veterans. We have educational benefits. We have some care. Uh, there are attempts to make steps forward to get veterans the care they need. Yeah, I mean, all of you are familiar with the stuff that's going on out in Phoenix where people are on death lists and, you know, they're doing a shell game with how long people have waited for care and all this sort of stuff. We need to continue to improve on that because, you know, folks are not going out to make paper. We don't sell insurance. We're going out to risk our lives. And a lot of times we come back broke um, from direct combat with the enemy or sickness because of conditions that are just unlivable or... You know, I, for example, I lived a quarter mile from a trash dump where they buried everything from human remains to ammunition to oil to, I mean, they dragged a tank over there that had been shot by a uh, DU round. I mean, it's just, whatever, let's burn it. And we breathe that smoke for a year. I, I, you know, my teeth are going to fall out one day and I'm going to have new Gulf War syndrome or something. We need those support and services. Um, the last thing I'd say what we owe our vets is don't pander to our veterans. You know, um, I do cringe at the thank you for your service when I'm in uniform and people walk up and just blindly thank me. What does that mean? I, I do cringe when everybody asks, do you have PTSD? Did you kill anybody? Th these are not what we need. We need folks to walk up and go, hey, just like the shoemaker, just like the banker, just like the educator, you play an important role in our society. Most recently, you played an important role. Congratulations, good job. Now get back to being a citizen. No special treats, no favors. Let's go. Come on. You, you, if you treat people like they're broken, many more will act like it. So that's, those are kind of some of the things that I think about when we, when we talk about what we owe our vets. What is the role and the place of veterans now was the other question that I got out of the, the paperwork. Um, I think veterans need to be members uh, integrated and productive in society. You know, if you think about World War II, after the big one, folks got out, lots of veterans went and built businesses, 
They they took leadership of corporations, of government, of all, all aspects of society. The leadership skills, the confidence, the team building that folks learn in the military can easily be translated to society. And that's one of the great benefits of our, of our military is that when folks depart the military for the next mission, they take some of those skills and, and hopefully become an additive, productive member of society. So when I think about where vets belong, you know, let's go. You're just another person, right? He sits among you, as an example. So those are kind of the two things. And then, I, you know, I, this whole idea is wrapped in the ideas, ideals of morality and uh, ethics and philosophy. So allow me, as a lay person, to speak badly about these topics. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. Are you taking notes? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you don't write, I'm, it's going to make me feel like I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> we talk a lot about combat and war. Is there is there a difference in the amount of moral injury sustained when people believe in the mission versus when they don't? Did we did we not know about moral injury during World War II, or did we not experience it because the United States was existentially threatened? Are our tactics, techniques, and procedures influential on whether or not people experience moral injury? In Iraq and Afghanistan, we implemented counterinsurgency, invade, dominate, build the, uh, build the host nation's capacity, police, infrastructure, uh, military, government, <coughs> economy, right? And then they will love us because we gave them democracy, and then we'll bolt, right? That didn't go so well. That hasn't gone so well in any historical campaign that I can study. Look at uh, uh, Napoleon and France. Or uh, Spain, forgive me, France, uh, Spain. Now we're doing counterterrorism, <laughs> and some of you may be reading little snippets about it, and some of you may not. But that's basically where we put UAVs over the bad guys, and we find them. And when we find the bad guys, we shoot them with a the Hellfire missile. And we have we have extensively disabled Al Qaeda's infrastructure network, right? And and, and we have significantly reduce the threat to the United States. So is there less moral injury because we're getting better at the type of mission we select to handle the threat? Something else to consider. So that's kind of at the, the zoomed in view. Now let's back out a little bit. Moral ethics and philosophy as they relate to combat and war is a delicious, juicy topic, but maybe not the best one, or maybe not one, maybe the only one that you've been exposed to. How about the Army stateside? There are some real meat on the bone there for anybody who wants to go take a look. We have a lot of challenges in the military with sexual assault, sexual harassment, suicides, domestic abuse, substance abuse. Let's get after that, right? Aren't those ailments as well that we need to look at? And I think if you looked at things and you added them up, we would see that that makes up a, large, a, a much larger population than the, the small element of combat forces who have come back with uh, traumatic stress and moral injury as a, as a result of close combat. We've got a lot more alcoholics and wife beaters and uh, uh, child pornography uh, uh, users than we, would, th than we need, right? Um, you know, and, and in my mind, just as a sort of an aside, um, there is an 800-pound gorilla in the room that we need to get after. What branch were you? Marines. Marines. Who, anybody Army? When did you get out? A uh, hundred years ago. <laughs> 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 right. So let me tell you about Army bases today. At right just inside of the gate, on the way out of the Army bases, on every Army base there's a building, and it's called a Class 6 and they sell alcohol there. And it's the biggest building that the Army Air Force Exchange Services has on post. That's where they sell all their free cheap, or cheap tax-free booze. And on a Friday afternoon, the parking lot is jammed, and the lines are full, and they got all the registers open. Now, if you go back and you look at all these negative outcomes that we have, domestic abuse, DUI, motorcycle accidents, child neglect, sexual assault, 
suicide, what have you, and you, you peel the onion back a little bit, I think you would find a significant percentage of those have to do or, or had alcohol as a contributing factor. So we need to kind of, you know, talk philosophically and theoretically about these things, but there are also practical things that we can do to get at that matter today. And that's kind of some of the, the thoughts that I have there. Let's back out another field of view. Or real quick, uh, one more aside on the, uh, at, the, at the Army stateside level. Um, moral injury and traumatic stress don't just happen as a result of combat. My significant emotional event occurred stateside in a peacetime environment where I was forced to make a decision between putting my career on the line and standing up for my people or not being loyal to my people but protecting my career. Right? I was never in physical harm. But boy, was that a traumatic event for me. And was there not a discrepancy between what I thought was right and what I thought I had to do and all this sort of stuff. I told you I'd speak as a layperson. Let's back out another field of view. The Army is a reflection of the society of which it serves. Are the challenges that we face in the military, especially those I highlighted stateside, exclusive to the Army? Or are they reflective of the society which it serves, the broader society that just doesn't get as much attention because nobody's out there tracking how many events the civilians do? Something to think about. And then is that not the same condition that you might see nationwide, or I'm sorry, worldwide. Has anybody been over to Korea? Right? How about women's rights there? Has anybody been over to, uh, um, what's the other one? There are other places where prostitution is legal. There are other places, uh, Thailand, where uh, uh, child prostitution is pseudo-legal. There are places around the world where, you know, drugs are legal, where domestic abuse is accepted. So we just kind of need to think about this in a broader sense as well. And then I also kind of flippantly wrote another one down. In six billion years, let's back out another field of view, and this is maybe for a laugh or not. In six billion years, the sun is going to die. When it does, before it collapses, it'll expand. And the, the diameter of the expansion is greater than the orbit of the Earth. The Earth will be burned up. We have 17 light years to the nearest star. It's not probably going to happen. Everything will be erased. There will be no memory of, no p proof of this situation or any of these moral injuries or any of these problems or ails that I'm describing. So maybe all this is just kind of a, a joke and we should all go to the beach anyway. <laughs> I don't know. Just again, I told you I was going to speak as a layperson. And then the last but not least, let's beware of absolutes and extremes, especially with regard to things like gratitude. Can we be grateful toward our troops, but also hold them accountable? Can we be proud of certain things and ashamed of others? So we set things up, right? It's sort of the Fox versus MSNBC. It's the they're either good or they're bad. It's one or the other. And I do this with my cadets. I, I describe situations and say, this or that, pick now. Pick now, this or that. And they get very nervous because it's, it's too bad. I'm essentially putting them in sort of the lesser of two evil traps. And I want them to go, well, hold on, time out, boss. This is A, that's B, but there's also C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. This, these aren't the only two things, right? It's not either or, it could be in the middle somewhere. The same is true for stereotypes. Beware of stereotypes. A lot of people think about the soldier sitting on the porch with his AR-15 in his lap, reading his copy of No Easy Day, watching uh, the interview. And, um, you know, there's some truth to that, right? There are some, some, some ways that we think about these things. But many soldiers are deeply thoughtful people with goals and hopes and dreams that extend beyond their time and service in the military. Many want a family. Many, many are pacifists by other means. So, you know, I, I got it. Some of the stereotypes are funny. Some of them are true. They are stereotypes for a reason. 
but just think through all the different dimensions and aspects of those individuals as you confront and engage with them. And then finally, <clears throat> I gotta make a good military hula plug. I'd just like to say there's room for all different perspectives and that's why I appreciate our discussion here today. One of the perspectives that I'd most uh, like you to think about is that all of our rights in this imperfect democracy, all of our freedoms, your prerogative to agree or disagree with my statement today, our ability to sit here and talk, to disagree, to say bad things about our government, to burn our flag, to write a book that no one, you know, that, that, is, that is controversial, to make a movie, to live a lifestyle, all of that is ultimately afforded to you by our country. And the, the might of our military is sort of the enforcement of that function. So in some ways, we may not be, you may not be interested in supporting the troops or, or believing in the military or pro-military or whatever, but, but if, you, if you like America, then we're bedfellows, whether you want to admit it or not. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here again, and I look forward to the discussion. Next up, we have Rich Quickstein. So, hi. Um, I am a psychotherapist. I'm a, a clinical social worker at the Shepherd Center uh, in the military initiative, just like it's written in the brochure. Um, that started in about 2007 with uh, Shepherd in July. Um, before that, I was working in substance abuse, uh, both for the Army and civilian, but mostly the federal. Um, Anyway, Sh uh, Share Military Initiative started in July, of, or in July, in 2007, roughly, uh, when a couple of uh, donors that had a pocket full of money said uh, the VA was uh, pretty jacked up and not doing things in the best way for the veteran for, for treatment of traumatic brain injury, because remember, Shepard is spinal cord and brain injury hospital, um, but also uh, not treating psychological injuries and uh, which also fall, uh, can cover the moral and spiritual injuries uh, that both Liz and uh, Josh talked about. Um, so I'm a part of that. I'm, I'm a psychotherapist. I work uh, both individually with each vet, with, not with each veteran, but with my caseload and with families of the uh, caseload of the psychologist I work with. We kind of share that. Um, again, we treat not just psychological uh, issues, but the whole person. So on our staff is uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, recreational, because we're treating the whole person. The goal and the aim is to reintegrate, to allow this person, whoever that person is, male, female, um, to come back into their families, come back into society as a whole, come back into the community, and live a life that is true to their goals, their life goals, true to their values uh, that we gain from whatever our upbringing is. Um, in working with, with uh, these individuals, I kind of, uh, this is a very personal thing for me, so um, I, my very first deployment was in, uh, I left uh, Japan on the USS Bunker Hill in October of 1990, uh, who was born after that. Thank you. Um, so uh, anyway, so that was my first deployment and spent the first, uh, spent about four months in the Persian Gulf during the Gulf War. Um, but it's still very personal because, and this goes, this is a very personal experience for me because one of the things that Liz was talking about is feeling worthy. And a lot of veterans feel kind of the way I did, kind of the way I do when I'm not sure if I did enough while I was there. I'm not sure I did enough during the six years in the Navy, so I want to continue to serve. I've had so many people tell me, look me square in the eye, walking on a crutch with a broken something and, and a back that's just completely jacked, say to me, if they said I can go back, I'd go back right now. Um, and so this is my way of doing that. And I'm not doing, I'm not saying that to accept praise or to look for praise. I'm doing that. This is just my, my mission, basically, my purpose. Which also is another thing. That um, myself and my, my uh, partner try and do is to help 
our veterans forge or reforge a new purpose, which is one of the main things that when coming out of the military, it's, that's one of the things that not goes away, but it just kind of, it, it's not the same. Um, so in, in doing so, we deal with not just traumatic reactions, traumatic stress reactions of checking a room when you walk into it, having thought of how many, uh, how many different ways I can dispatch someone if they become a threat to me, but also uh, dealing with things such as moral and spiritual injury of not being able to act when I knew I could save somebody. I had a client that I worked with late last year um, who in his childhood was a victim of rape. And at the point when he was witnessing someone be raped, could not leave his position because it would jeopardize the mission in many, many lives. And so there, right, right in that is an extreme spiritual and moral injury. Because he could have acted with the weapon that was in his hands. But if he did that, then far in the future, uh, well, not too far, a couple months in the future, would not have played an intelligence part in killing a terrorist that has killed a lot of people and stopping that. So there's this um, uh, ethicist in here, guys, um, the uh, classic train decision. Uh, send the train down one track and kill one person versus down the other track and kill many people. Right? Um, and the decision, the decision tree of one or the other is obviously not that simple, but for this particular sailor, he had the decision to make to risk his life versus risking many other lives versus allowing this person to be raped and Ultimately, because this was in the Middle Eastern uh, Muslim country, uh, murdered by her family because it was over by a So not just those things, um, but my goal hopefully is to allow someone to step back into their families, to step back into society, and re-understand one main core of the military of groupthink versus the the, the gross approach to American society, and I know I'm overgeneralizing here, but as individual, as each individual person has the value, and that my value may be greater to me, of course, than anyone else, versus one thing that is in the Army Soldier Creed is take care of soldiers first. And so I'm always looking out as opposed to looking in. I'm always last as a service member, especially as an NCO or an officer. I'm always looking out for the people that I'm leading, but also serving. And so there's a big change um, that I hopefully help people make room for. Um, so it's not just working with these, these, these issues of traumatic reactions, but helping someone make room in their spirituality, helping someone make room in their new them, so to speak. Helping them realize that it may be necessary to identify a new them. Um, one other issue that I think was brought up earlier was um, that the citizenry needs to uh, step up and digest information that is not necessarily played on the news in the United States as much as possible. I know this because I was a journalist for 10 years as well. So from 2000, and this is my undergraduate degree in journalism, from 2000 to 2010, I was a photojournalist at a newspaper down the road in South Carolina. But during that time, I spent a uh, little bit of time uh, covering post-combat uh, honeymoonish type of period in Iraq and southern Iraq, in Central and Southern Iraq. But most of all, one thing that sticks out to me was sitting in the newsroom in the news budget meeting, uh, deciding what to put on the front page when four contractors who were all, all former SEALs were captured and murdered in Fallujah in 2004. And not putting that information on the front page at that time, or at least putting it in a more prominent place for the citizen, really, for our readership to look at, does them a disservice because the information to make decisions on who to vote for is put there. Because I think one of the things that, that Josh pointed out is that as a military member, we were told. But one thing is there's not a lot of rep uh, thought on repercussions after we were told. 
but also citizenry um, and our readership is from myself as a newspaper journalist, and we want to put that information out there because it affects your decision making. It also affects whether or not you or me or anyone else walks up to somebody and says an empty thank you versus a eye contact and a handshake and a sit down, tell me your story, not just thanks, see you um, And so uh, to, to kind of close, the idea for me is not assimilation, not overgeneralization, not else to put this, but to kind of step back into the role of this is the uniform or the, or the clothing that we all have on now, and shedding the uniform that identifies us as service members, but coming back into the uniform that identifies us as an active citizen. And hopefully that's my goal in the end result that we're working on. Thank you. So it's going to sound like the P stand for premises, 
these are assumptions I'm going to make, and the, 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 the C, uh, C stand for conclusions. So P for premise, C for conclusion. Uh, this is how philosophers think, kind of artificial, but it, it allows for sort of a clean approach. Uh, premise one, if one person should be very grateful to a second, then the second tried to benefit the first in the relevant way. Okay, this is the kind of key idea. Why are you grateful to your mother, uh, but you're not grateful to an NFL running back? Well, the idea is that your mother tried to benefit you in the relevant way, and the NFL quarterback did not. Premise two just says that this applies across, across groups. So if premise one is true, then if one group should be very grateful to a second, think of citizens and veterans, then in general, the second tried to benefit the first in the relevant way. Conclusion. Hence, if one group should be very grateful to a second, then in general, the second tried to benefit the first the relevant way. Okay, so we have a test here. If A should be very grateful to B, then B tried to benefit A in the relevant way. Well, premise three then is really actionist. It says, it is false that as a group, veterans tried to benefit citizens in the relevant way. That is, veterans don't meet this test, hence it falls, conclusion two, that citizens should not, be, uh, should not be very grateful veterans. Again, C2 is my thesis. Okay, so what do we mean when we say that one person tried to benefit the other party in a relevant way? Well, here's what I think is the best interpretation of it. Premise 1 rests on the following. A tries to benefit B in the relevant way, if and only if, that's just saying equivalent to, if and only it's just fancy philosophical terminology. A reasonably attempted to provide a significant benefit to B, and a was primarily motivated by concern for B's well-being. Okay. So we can break this down into three conditions. First, the benefactor's primary motivation was to provide the benefit. That is, the benefactor is trying to benefit the, benefit, uh, uh, the beneficiary. Second, contribution. The benefactor tried to provide a significant benefit. Or on some alternative theories, uh, the benefit actually provides a significant benefit. And then third, the benefactor's effort was reasonable that is, it rested on adequate evidence. Well, are these conditions met? I claim that at least two of the conditions are not met. Third one is not entirely clear. Okay, take the motivation. Was the primary motivation of the veterans try and provide the benefit? That is, to help the beneficiary. Well, the studies we have here suggest when you look at why people join the military, that the dominant view involves the, the dominant motivation expressed has to do with um, some sort of lifestyle feature, right? Either economic, um, adventure, friendships, things like that, some sort of personal gain. When we do surveys as to why veterans fight, why they fight in combat, what most motivates them in combat, the explanation, the dominant explanation, is they're fighting for the buddies. They're not fighting for an ideal, they're not fighting for the American people. When it comes down to brass tacks in combat, they are fighting for the buddies. So are they motivated then to, as a primary motivation, to benefit the American citizenry? Well, I'm sure that is a motivation, but it's not the dominant motivation. And one more way you can see this is recruitment is highly sensitive to economic um, incentives. That is, you can increase recruitment, decrease recruitment, increase the quality, decrease the quality through economic incentives, suggesting that there's a strong self-interest involved. What's wrong with that? But if we're looking for a, a primary attempt to benefit another, that is relevant. What about contribution? Did veterans try to provide a significant benefit? Well, let's look at whether they actually provided a significant benefit um, as some sort of evidence of whether they tried to do so. Well, contribution is a, is a function of, of replacement cost. That is, how much did you uh, give to another? And what was the cost of getting you to do that? Well, for any one soldier, leading, leading aside the sort of um, some dominant geniuses, you know, for instance, General Grant or something like that. The idea is the contribution is not that great. I mean, with any one soldier or sailor or Marine, it's not going to make a big difference for the American people in terms of how the war goes. In addition, in addition, if that individual wasn't there, there would be some likelihood that someone else would be in that position operating that same role. And in any case, this benefit was paid for and paid for well. The dominant studies we have of military pay show that they are overpaid, both in terms of pay and in terms of benefits, relative to the civilian counterparts. Now, you might think, well, who cares about pay? Maybe we shouldn't, but if we're looking at net benefit provided, what you try to provide, 
You look at what you contributed versus what it cost to contribute and how hard it was to replace you. Well, some people will say, well, look, it's not, um, it's not what the individual veteran provided. Rather, it's what the collection of veterans, that together uh, they provide something which is invaluable to us. And I think that's true. But that's not only true for them. That's also true for farmers. That's also true for intellectuals. To see why, imagine that there were no farmers and no one else occupied that role. Well, um, most of us, if not all of us, would be dead. What about if someone else occupied that role? If other people, if all the current farmers are dead, other people stepped into their roles. Okay, well in that case, we, we'd do well. But the same thing applies to the military. If the current member of the military, mil members of the military sat, sat down, if someone else occupied that role, well again, we'd have, um, we'd have some sort of defense. So when you ask, do veterans contribute more than other groups, or as a collection, do veterans contribute more than others? I don't see it. So go ahead and jump in. Take farmers, right? Um, I think that Americans are not and should not be very grateful to farmers. You get no holidays, no statutes, you don't see presidential proclamations, you don't see their celebration in the public arena, there's no indication that they're uh, paid more than civilian counterparts. And I think that's fine. But the question is, are they morally similar to veterans? And I think they are. They both provide an essential service without which we'd be dead. And obviously, farmers and, 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 and veterans support each other, right? Farmers wouldn't be doing well if people stole their crops, like foreign invaders. Similarly, veterans wouldn't be very, uh, doing very well if they were starving on the battlefield. And reasonable effort. Did veterans make a reasonable effort to benefit us? Well, I mean, it depends on sort of what service you think they're providing. If you think they're providing general deterrence against attack in general, yeah, I think that's a pretty reasonable thing to provide. If you think that they're providing service in terms of killing people and breaking things in particular wars, then it depends on the wisdom of those wars and whether there was adequate evidence to think that those wars were going to accomplish good things. So if you thought, I'm taking no position here, but if you thought, for example, that World War I was not a particularly productive war for the U.S., or that you thought this was true of the Vietnam or the Serbian or the Iraqian war, then you might think, well, it's not clearly satisfy the reasonable effort condition. So the question is, do they satisfy the three conditions, motivation, contribution, or reasonable effort? Well, it's not clear to me that they satisfy conditions of one. The reason depend on the context. It's not clear that they satisfy condition two. <clears throat> just really quick, why does this matter? Do you mind think, well, all right, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Why care? Why should we care whether or not there's too much gratitude expressed to veterans? Well, I think there are three reasons this matters. First, if you have too much gratitude, this is going to uh, result in inefficient results. In particular, it's going to provide an incentive for many of the best and the brightest to go into the military rather than other fields, such as being judges, such as being physicians, such as being business leaders or being academics. Right? It matters whether you have an efficient distribution of your best and brightest in society. To the extent that you get a maldistribution, because of this gratitude, that's going to produce inefficiency, making a lot of us worse off. Second of all, you might think mistaken gratitude is a vice. It's just a mistake to be very grateful to people who are not worthy of it. Third policy. I think mistaken gratitude leads to worse policies, such as the amount of resources spent on the military, or the selection of leaders such as the President and members of Congress. Okay, so you might think we're spending too much on the military if you thought that, in part because of this gratitude. Or you might think the fact that since, uh, since Richard Nixon was President, um, there's 1.5 of, of candidates per presidential period who are, who are members of the military. Are we getting the best leaders, or are we overemphasizing members of the military for the presidency? And then third, I think there is a um, bit of this. Third, I think there's a conceptual error that we make when we sort of overemphasize gratitude toward veterans. And that is, sometimes we don't pull out of wars because we think we should celebrate the sacrifices of members made by members of the military. So a particular concern is that honoring wounded or killed veterans might lead the country to try and double down in a war that is not worthwhile. And this ties into an economic era. So, in short, here's my claim. Americans should not be very grateful to veterans. Um, and I do think it has deleterious effects to, to, to being too grateful. That's it. Thank you. And next is Rich Williams.
Stephen's a hard act to follow, <laughs> especially as a veteran. Uh, I, I wanted to use you should thank him for that, though. On, uh, <laughs> on my service, uh, after your college, I joined the Air Force. How many of you were born uh, after 1975? So virtually all of you. Um, you know, 1974 was a was a very important year. It was the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, I did not serve in Vietnam. I was still in training when the war ended. But there was a lot of animosity towards veterans, which continued for many years after the war. And as Stephen stated, it, it might have been a deterrent for the best and brightest to join the military because it was viewed as a very negative thing. Uh, there was a very negative viewpoint of veterans as baby killers. The Mille Act, uh, massacre had occurred, and lots of folks were labeled with that same uh, paintbrush. Bitterness about the Vietnam War and the loss of 58,000 mostly men a few women died as well, but mostly men were serving in Vietnam in combat wars. There was a very different treatment of veterans compared to today. As President Obama said in a uh, speech in 2010 Memorial Day of the Vietnam War, Vietnam veterans were denigrated rather than celebrated. And I, I agree with that. Um, they should have been thanked for their service, valor, and sacrifice. Um, the politics of the war were not separated from the valor and sacrifice of veterans and their families. Uh, only the year, in fact, a, only this year, a commemoration uh, and thanking of Vietnam veterans is being conducted. The commemoration is not intended to commemorate the war and whether it was lost by politicians or other issues, but to recognize that veterans serve their country despite the politics of the conflict, and many times their families suffer and sacrifice as much. Uh, I was an enlisted soldier for eight years, uh, and I served as an air traffic controller and an intelligence analyst. I worked on the Iran rescue wish mission, which most of you probably don't remember under Carter. Uh, I was then commissioned in 1983 and was made a nuclear launch officer of Minuteman 3 intercontinental ballistic missiles. I remember one interview by a journalist from Boulder, Colorado, which is, if you know Colorado, is a very liberal town, who wanted to know how we had been brainwashed and could support mutually assured uh, destruction, or MAD, which is sort of an unfortunate term, policy of the Cold War era. Afterwards, I was the chief of protocol for the military space shuttle program, which was slated to be launched from California. And we had one of our shuttles on the pad to be launched uh, 90 days, but the uh, Challenger accident happened, and they completely canceled the West Coast military shuttle program. After 24 years in the military, I then retired and uh, joined the Federal Civil Service. After a year, I was then hired as a foreign policy advisor in Naples, Italy for five years, moved to Izmir, Turkey in the same job, uh, working for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, in that job, I, was help, I helped to assess uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Macedonia, and Czechoslovak republics to become members of NATO. Uh, I deployed to southern Turkey as the policy advisor uh, during the Iraq war for the air campaign in Iraq. And some of the decisions I made was whether or not we would strike a target despite collateral damage based on the strategic or uh, tactical advantage of striking that target, knowing that there would be collateral damage. That happens in every war. Uh, I was then at Air Combat Command at Langley and uh, did similar work back to Turkey, back to Langley. And uh, finally, for the last seven years, I worked in the Secretary of Defense's office, uh, working for commemorations, thanking and honoring veterans for various conflicts. Um, the Vietnam War commemoration is what I'm working on right now. I retired last October, but was hired back as a federal consultant to uh, represent the Southeast region. So I live here in Georgia. That's what I do uh, for the commemoration. I mention all this background as a segue into some of the problems facing all veterans. Uh, I wanted to give a few examples of the difference in their lifestyle than most careers where you stay in a town and you do one job and you have your family there and you have support networks. Um, constant moves of every two or three years with your entire family. <coughs> this causes problems with relationships, kind of spouse work. Children are constantly changing schools. Is there a support network for special needs children? Uh, constant travel, making new friends every, every two to three years and adjusting to new cultures. The constant stress with cultural issues, for example, living in foreign countries, language, social norms, food, etc. Distance from a media family, which would be a normal support group for issues like child care. Obvious issues with PTSD in combat situations, but not just in combat. For example, in 1974, our headquarters and the officers club at Ramstein were, brought, uh, were bombed by Red Brigade terrorists killing several in Ramstein. Several U.S. personnel were all, are also arrested by that group during that time frame for political reasons. The transition to civilian life is difficult because the, 
of the perception some may have of veterans and the difficulty of translating their military service and training to a civilian career. Moral issues with some of the duties, for example, shooting other people, but also collateral damage during attacks. Drone pilots suffer PTSD knowing that they're killing folks thousands of miles away and in some cases finding out that they killed civilians even though they're sitting in an air-conditioned building in Nevada or, or Virginia. The frustration of dealing with civilians who have difficulty relating to the experiences that military personnel have. A large number of my veteran friends, as many of us have mentioned earlier, do not want to be thanked for their service by random strangers who they feel, although they may be well-intentioned, the veterans can't see how a civilian could possibly know what the service member has experienced. Uh, I'm enjoying this discussion, and I'm going to end on that note, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, how about we do this, because uh, I know that some of you have to run in about seven minutes, but we'll be happy to stick around afterwards to continue the conversation. Why don't we open it up to uh, audience comments and questions, and the panelists, as they'd like, can uh, jump in and offer some reflections on it. So, how about it? I, 
I actually, I mean, I, I like the idea. I'm just not sure I agree with it. I mean, again, again imagine you have a neighbor, and he, he said there's all these geological tests that discover that there's a lot of oil on his property. And he starts, he builds the oil there, and he starts pumping it out. We say, hey, if there's oil under his property, there probably is ours as well. We do the same thing, we become extremely wealthy. He wasn't trying to benefit us whatsoever, but he provided us a tremendous financial gain. I, I would claim that would be a mistake to be grateful to him. I mean, he wasn't trying to benefit me. But yep. he did benefit me. I just think we'll go right in that one. Um, uh, I guess I got a lot of questions going around. I keep hearing you say very grateful. So I mean, is it? And I know I kind of I walked in late, um, but I mean, isn't that kind of subjective? What you should be grateful for? I mean, because I can see you still being grateful, not necessarily to that person, but that this happened at all. And I'm, I was kind of thinking off when you were talking about uh, an, another subject, another reason to be grateful or not. Um, and could you, when you were talking to this gentleman over here, could you give me your se your second uh, reason for, you know, why or why or why not to be grateful to somebody? Yeah, I mean, so you want to have sort of a motivation, right? Okay. The person was either strongly or primarily uh, trying to benefit you. Mm -hmm. so it's a motivated benefit. You. Secondly, they um, tried to prevent a significant benefit. It wasn't sort of a small benefit, but they tried to prevent a significant benefit. And the third thing was they made a reasonable effort. Right? It was based on the evidence that was reasonably available to them. If you fail on one or more of those, then you might be very grateful, but it would be a mistake. And here's an analogy. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you had an eighth grade teacher. Okay. And you're really grateful to your eighth grade teacher, but in fact, your eighth grade teacher was just a really poor teacher. And in fact, she didn't really care very much for the students, she didn't try very hard, and she didn't look at the evidence in terms of what would be good teaching. So you were grateful, in fact, you're very grateful, but in fact, it's a mistake. You might think, look, that, that's an error, right? You should not, you should not be grateful. And my idea is that a similar thing applies to the military. Not that they failed in the way in which a great teacher failed, but their motivation and reasonable effort and um, th things like that were not met. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I get your point. However, I think there's, in, if we're going to talk about uh, spiritual and moral injury and talk about reintegration, uh, I think that and in no way do I do that. that it's kind of short sighted to think of primary motivation for service, primary motivation for gratitude, when connection with the, uh, something greater than oneself and being or, being or playing a part or playing a role in the value of healing the person that's coming back to the world, I think is a greater purpose and has nothing to do whether, yes, of course, that some people are going to say, thanks for your service because I didn't have to go, et cetera, et cetera. But being a part of that healing and being a part of, of, of the uh, welcoming back into the fold after doing things that are unspeakable, after seeing things that are unspeakable, after experiencing hell, I think serves a much greater um, moral uh, approach to society as a whole, regardless of whether it's the United States of America or not. I think welcoming that service member back is serves that purpose and has almost little to do with what you're suggesting. Yes, I'm not sure we, we disagree. I, mean, I suspect mm -hmm. we're I do think you should welcome people back who've, who've had difficulties or have been excluded from the community. And that, you and I agree. But that's true whether or not you're a veteran or whether or not you just got released from the penitentiary. It's good and it's important to welcome people back and have a loving atmosphere. I just don't see that being tied to gratitude. I, I know I want to give you all, some people have to run, so I want to give people, it's okay if you have to take off, but we're going to stick around for another seven or so minutes to continue the conversation, and I think Greg, you were next, and then we'll percolate in this direction, we'll go to you next. Okay, yeah, this is also for Professor Kirchner. Uh, I want to push you on primary motivation because I don't know that as you've explained it, I can have a primary motivation right now at time T1, right? But if you go back to time T minus 100, I might have had a different primary motivation. And I think that you can find a chain of tracing effect such that an individual has a series of things that make them make a decision. Okay? And one of those things might be that let's say you're 17 and your primary Mary mo motivation at the time for considering joining the military is to defend your country. Okay. 
Okay. So at the time that you might be in battle, it might be the case that you would say something along the lines of, I'm really only concerned about like a band of brothers right now, but I think that previously there there may be some kind of set of causal states where your primary motivation uh, actually was to make a kind of contribution to your your country, and it's not clear to you based on the empirical studies that you have talked about because you didn't present what those are. Uh, it's not clear to me how they might rule out that individuals at a certain point in time are actually primarily motivated in joining the military to, uh, to help their country. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, I like the question. So how do you know what the primary motivation is? Well, in theory, decide what a motivation is. You, you look at kind of desires or intentions, whatever drives a person forward, and we can sort of, we can sort of measure these things by how intense they are and how long they last. So intensity times duration. So that's in theory, how would we do it? If we want to know what motivates people to join the military, I mean, we either look at studies or we look at anecdotes. I mean, I'm not sure what else we have. It's not clear that anecdotes support the notion that they're trying to serve the American people. Studies, as far as I can tell, don't show that to be sort of a dominant or large-scale motivation. Uh, so I'm not sure you know, how else we, we, we would determine that but for those two, but aside from those means. But don't you have gratitude for service people serving their country despite their motivation in joining the military? They're, well, they're protecting well, your rights, they're protecting your country, they're defending your... Well, your they are beliefs. certainly doing all those things. And farmers are growing my food so I'm not starving. Intellectuals are upholding the framework of rights so I don't get oppressed or slaughtered like in so many countries well, I don't think world. comparing farm work with a soldier in combat is, is comparable. I'm sorry. So, so just on point, so you think the soldiers contribute more, or they sacrifice more? Or I think they what's sacrifice. The, I think there's a, there's a greater sacrifice. more strongly at risk, the more comparable to the police force. I mean, issues about the police right. force, because you're putting the money at risk. Let me, let, me, work. let me get on the other side of this thing real quick. How many more farm-related injuries are there a year than military-related injuries? I, I don't know that I don't know that that's that's a true the true notion that soldiers are more at risk, but I mean, it, I don't know is, is the other way to kind of play this thing instead of dialing down soldier or gratitude towards soldiers, can we just dial up everybody else's gratitude? I mean, the farmers <laughs> right. the farmers have Labor Day, right? <laughs> briefly say that, that, that one group sacrifices more than the other. Look, jobs have, have baskets of benefits and costs. Right? So if you're deciding whether to be in the military or being a teacher, right? Um, the, the upside of being in the military is you get, what, a band of brothers. Do teachers have that? In general, I don't think so. Do they get adventure? No. Do they get the same rate of pay? No. I can't track this with studies, but I suspect this is true. The military report that they do much better in terms of social life, both in terms of dating and marriage. For young men, that matters. They get better educational opportunities. All those are benefits. The costs are you take a risk physically, psychologically, and morally. Are the benefits outweigh the costs? That's an individual choice. Some people like the teacher package. Some people like the military package. If you like the military package more, it's hard to see why you would say that you uh, uh, merit gratitude on the basis of that. In the same way, playing in the NFL has a lot of benefits and risks that work in factory doesn't. Some people like A, some people like B. There's no question of playing the NFL, which would much greater risk uh, in a whole bunch of ways, but most obviously to your brain. Yes. I, mean, I, just, I just have two questions. One is just it kind of goes to what some people were saying, which was that um, you know defining gratitude narrowly as kind of a, a debt um, and then fo focus it on intention, but it's all on the intention. When somebody can say and come and say, you know, your intention was to do this, but the consequence that you've actually created has been these things. So it's kind of a, to look at it instead of just the intention of one person, put it in the social context as this communication and this gifting going back and forth to say that you might not have intended to do certain things, but you did. This is what you participated in, you didn't realize it. Um, so maybe to look at gratitude in, in many different ways in terms of consequences. And the second thing, which is for those who've um, worked with, uh, with veterans, a lot of moral injury and PTSD is focused on the veteran experience. 
Um, since, and, and not so much on the larger political violence that they're participating in. I was just wondering if veterans have reflected on um, the other people in the countries in which they fought, who might have been civilians, who've also seen what they've seen, maybe from another perspective, um, experienced what they've experienced. Have they had any reflections about moral injury being broader than just veterans, but maybe something that's shared in on both sides, um, veteran of uh, uh, civilian and soldier? Those are two questions. I think um, to assume that they haven't, um, I think is ignorant. I think to um, think that uh, military members uh, might not be thinking, feeling, intelligence, highly intelligent individuals, I think is ignorant. Um, so the simple answer to your question after all those words is yes. Um, the problem is, not problem, but the issue comes in is um, this is what I'm looking at when I'm dealing with my own stuff and I have to take time to allow myself to diffuse the back off and be able to see it. Um, Sometimes that is part of the moral injury, uh, or, or the, the traumatic event, traumatic injury, is that they've caused this, or they've seen that, on, uh, they've seen or witnessed that something happen, uh, someone else, a civilian, or someone that perpetrates something. So you can, uh, absolutely, I don't know if you guys have anything. I would just say that, I mean, all over the world, it's, it's there are cultural things involved. Uh, I spent some time in Korea, and um, you know all the Americans are ready to rock. You know the North Koreans are our enemy, right? We've got battle plans. We're going to kill them and blow them up, and you know repel the horde, and then push back and transition in all our keywords. And the, the South Koreans are like, "Hey, that's just a wayward brother, and this is a temporary spat, and we're going to get over it." So you know those two frameworks, you know, kind of through those two different lenses, you've got to have a different view on bad stuff when it happens. We may see it as the way we see it, and they may see it as a necessary way to, to reunify the family. I mean, I don't know, I'm just kind of speculating, but I think there's some, I think culturally there's some things to think about there as well. We have time for one more question. I think, uh, Sean, I saw your hand about five minutes ago. <laughs> um, so if we accept that maybe it's likely that there is either excessive gratitude or inappropriate gratitude to veterans. Would you have, um, uh, I guess, alternatives proposed for both interpersonal and broader social attitudes that we should hold with respect to veterans, given the facts that they suffer from uh, just the, I guess, very difficult conditions under which they serve, etc. So, I mean, it would be one thing to say, we shouldn't be grateful veterans. We could agree with that. I think it would be unsatisfying for everybody or most people to say we should not be grateful full stop, and now we just ignore them completely. Do you have what, what in your mind, Dr. Kirshner, or maybe some of the more appropriate attitudes we could take, adopt, both with respect to interpersonal relations in society? Do you have I mean, yeah, I, I don't think we should, we should treat them with, with either, neither like you know, charity nor neglect. We should just treat them like everyone else. So, I mean, I don't, when I meet farmers, when I meet, um, you know, police officers, when, when I meet uh, truckers, when I meet pilots, I'm not grateful, I'm not ungrateful, I just treat them as someone who's to chosen to do a job and you know, appreciate the fact that they, they provide you know, a, a service to me and they're, they're paid for it. I don't see why we want to um, express gratitude in those cases and a similar thing applies to veterans. And just one thing about terminology, note that we say that veterans serve but other people work. It's kind of an odd terminology, right? What, what other people not serve? I mean, either everyone serves or no one serves. I mean, so, even the notion of service, even the terminology is just problematic. The bill of gratitude right into it. Please join me in thanking our panelists.